Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, thank you for coming out to our second ever virtual Coffee and Capital. Um, it's perhaps our first ever afternoon session, at least in my time here. Uh, today's speaker, Sarah Holmes, is based in San Francisco, so our usual 8.30 start time wouldn't have made for the most energizing of conversations, so we appreciate her filling this time as an alternative. So thank you for joining us, Sarah. Uh, Sarah Holmes is here today representing Unshackled Ventures, which is a firm that invests in U.S. immigrant founders starting at day zero. Uh, Sarah is an associate at Unshackled, focusing on investing and programming. Uh, prior to Unshackled, she worked extensively with portfolio managers on growth and hiring strategies at First Round Capital. And today, she's here to answer your questions about the investment world. Uh, before we kick off, I just want to give a quick intro to how we will facilitate questions. Uh, at our last session, I was pretty surprised that we didn't really run into any issues of people talking over each other. So at least to start, um, you can feel free to unmute yourself to ask your questions. Um, when doing so, whenever you ask a question, um, if you could just give a quick introduction, uh, just give your name, your company or organization or whatever project you happen to be working on, and that would be great. Um, but if we, you know, after a while, tend to run into um, a little crosstalk. I'll just ask that we either use the reactions button down below. You'll see at the bottom of the video screen, um, it says reactions and there's either a thumbs up or like a hand clap. Um, when you hit that button, it'll show up next to your video and your name. Um, or you can also type in the chat box, I have a question. So I'll be keeping an eye on the chat reactions and the chat box. Um, and then I'll be writing down names. So if needed, I'll uh, call on you and then you can ask your question to Sarah directly. So uh, to get things started, Sarah, thank you again for joining us. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and then we can get into the questions. Yeah, of course. Um, so exciting to, to be on the call with all of you. So I started my career at an early stage startup. I helped build out an early sales team um, and then a customer success team, and then join First Round on their platform team. Uh, First Round is a seed stage fund. Uh, they have over 200 active portfolio companies, and I help those companies with their hiring and growth needs. Um, everything from sourcing candidates to setting up structured hiring strategies to running an online talent marketplace for them. Um, I recently joined Unshackled. My first day was actually the first day in uh, shelter in place in San Francisco. So it's been a pretty crazy, I guess, almost three months um, on the team, which is really insane. Um, and my role at Unshackled is really uh, kind of involves everything. We're a small fund. So there's five people in the fund, two GPs, um, and then three of us kind of running everything else. So everything from back office fund management to portfolio support to sourcing new deals, running diligence. Um, I just wrapped up a master class in being a founder. So I brought eight people who are still working full time, but thinking about being a founder and, and entrepreneurship and ran them through a master class of what it looks like to be a founder. Um, so really kind of involved in most projects that are that are kind of involved in a fund, um, which has been really exciting. Um, and so happy to answer kind of any questions about anything VC. Um, I also then have a background in recruiting. So if you're any questions about recruiting, I'm always happy to jump in on, um, but just excited to, to be here with all of you. Great, thanks, Sarah. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, feel free to unmute yourselves or you can uh, you know, use the reactions button or the chat box. But just to fill some air while people are thinking, uh, Sarah, I'll throw you uh, the question everyone's getting these days. I know you mentioned you started at um, Unshackled at the beginning of stay at home order. So um, I just wanna know how has the uh, COVID-19 situation impacted Unshackled? Yeah, of course. Um, so it's impacted us in a few ways. I would say the biggest one is we've had to change our investing process because we obviously now can't meet teams in person. Um, Unshackled runs a very structured process. So we ask that everybody fill out the pitches form on our website so that we get the same data from every team that comes in. Um, we also find that that 
uh, since we have three people from the investment team review every cold email, every pitch deck that comes through, we're trying to really expand access to venture and not only kind of move things forward that come through a warm intro. So we review every deck that comes through. Um, the next step then is a quick 20 minute call where we really dig into the founding team, recognizing that the pre-seed is really you're investing in people more than anything. And oftentimes we're trying to understand the frameworks that people are using to start their companies rather than having like specific answers on revenue or product or go to market. Um, we then have two one hour meetings with the GPs. Um, perhaps there's like a diligence call in between there, um, but that's really the process. And it used to be two in-person meetings. Obviously we've now switched those to hour long Zoom meetings. Um, so that's kind of an effect on our investment process. I would say the po almost positive effect, which I realize sounds really weird, um, is that we're committed to making only new investments over the ne next year and a half. Um, so for the rest of our fund, we will be investing in day zero startups um, and not out of this fund in follow on investments in current companies. Um, and so we're actually really excited to be actively investing. Um, I think we see this as an opportunity a, as talent is shifting, especially now at the stage of COVID. I think there's really exciting companies being formed um, and also founders who are able to navigate starting a company in a global pandemic in the state of the world in shelter in place are founders who we feel have the like tenacity to really make it long term. Um, and also are those like gritty founders that we really love to see uh, who are taking that leap at a time when it's probably arguably the hardest time to. Um, and so COVID has really pushed us to make new investments and, and be active and, and run programming and, and show that we oftentimes consider ourselves like the wartime VC um, and that we really lean into times of, of kind of craziness. And that's when some of the most exciting companies uh, sprout. Right, cool. Thanks for that. Um, just as a reminder, as I said at the top, uh, just give a quick introduction to yourself whenever you um, want to ask a question, and it would be great to hear uh, specifically what you're working on. So maybe just, you know, 30 seconds uh, about what's uh, going on in your world. So that'll help uh, understand who's in the room and, you know, if Sarah might be able to give you a more, uh, you know, directed answer. And it uh, looks like we have a uh, Malika. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct. Uh, Malika has a question, so feel free to ask away. Hi, everybody. My name is Malika Barrow. I'm a recent college graduate, and for the past two years, I've been working on launching my own signature spice business. And um, I'm currently an international student, so um, this past spring, I participated into a competition with my College of Business, and I got a little seed funding to get my business going and all that. And then one of my advisors, um, Andrew Graham, is the one who told me about this meeting. And because right now, because of my current situation as an international student, it's really hard to like set like a proper legal business while mm -hmm. being legal and all that. So my question is, how do you guys um, select the candidates that you want to work with what are, what are the different criteria that they have to meet like have you guys worked with international students before yeah um that's a great question and congratulations on graduating and launching a business very exciting um so our investment thesis is that and it stems from our gp's kind of ex personal experiences of trying to start a company on h1b visa, an h1b visa with a co-founder also on a visa um, is that it is just such an added obstacle for founders who are in the U.S. on visas. And a lot of times people say like, oh, you just can't do it. And we just don't believe that's true. Um, part of our partnership is actually with a law firm. And so when we invest, you get the fuel power of that law firm and they manage all of the visa needs for the founding team. We tend to have teams on get on what we call like path to perm and so maybe that's getting it to getting you to a green card getting the founders to a point where they can sponsor their own visa internally from their company and that's like a complicated relationship because you have to be in a um, ability to be fired to have your company sponsor your visa it's kind of like an odd wording um i think in your case 
are you on uh, OPT and can you get OPT extension? Um, so I'm about to start grad school in the fall. So I didn't look to like apply for OPT, but I'm looking to do that after I graduate from my yeah. master's. Um, so I think for everyone who's a student out there, um, being a student is an incredible time to be an early stage founder because you have two things. Um, you can be on a student visa and the .edu email address is clutch. People are, and especially now, I think you'll find people are, feel more inclined to answer emails to students. And so customer discovery, advisors, experts in the field, like you see, and, and I'm in that case too, like I see a .edu email and I'm like, oh, I should probably, like, I feel obligated to respond, which is awesome. Um, and so use that to your advantage. And then to your point on qualification. So when I look at a deck and I look at a team, I'm looking for a few big things. Are you solving a problem or are you solution first? And oftentimes we're more inclined for companies that have a unique insight into a space and are solving a problem that they can support with customer discovery. And so we invest pre-product, pre-revenue. You don't need to be able to like give me a demo or show me the product, but you need to be able to say like, we surveyed X amount of people and this percentage like confirm that this is a problem and this is how we're solving it and this is how it's different from everything else that's tried to solve this problem or that's in this space um and so we look for strength of team and strength of team is often challenging i'd say i look for what i call like sparks of entrepreneurship so especially for new grads did you start a club on campus were you in a leadership position and taking a full course load and volunteering that tells me you have like an ability to manage your schedule. That's a spark of founderdom, if you will. And then I would say it's really concentrating on the unique insight. And so um, why are you different and how are you gonna win this space? And that then builds into what is your moat? And so like, why won't everyone else be able to beat you? Um, in terms of industries, it obviously differs consumer versus B2B. Um, and consumer is really hard. Um, but, and so like when we look at consumer decks, we have a few other questions that we look into. Um, I think in the food space, it would be interesting if you were able to show like, how is your supply chain different? How are you reaching a new market? How are you, um, is it subscription? Is it, are you already in stores? Do you already have a wait list? Like kind of what is unique to you? Um, make it very obvious in like your deck and in your first emails. Sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, apologies in advance for anyone's name who I will butcher this afternoon. Uh, it's nothing personal. Um, so we have a question from Shranath, hopefully. Hi, hi, Sarah. How are you? Good. Thanks for asking a question. Yeah. Uh, hey, Jack. Uh, thank you so much for uh, you know like uh, putting this together, um, Sarah. So just going before going into what I'm doing right now, I'll just give a glimpse of you know what we're doing. So I was in the similar boat like how Nitin and Manan were there five years ago. So so I'll tell you my example. I came on F1 visa for my masters. Uh, that was in 2015, and I started my company in 2017. So being a student, master's degree with $50,000 on my head as a loan, I started the company along with my roommate and we had the similar problems, the legal issues and everything. I'm based in Texas and we don't know how to do it, but still we managed to register the company on one American person so that you know we can operate it and we can push the hurdles a little bit further. We made a revenue of $50,000. I was on OPT and still I did quit my Microsoft full-time job I worked on this till my STEM OPT started because when I'm STEM OPT, you need to run your payroll. Whereas my co-founder was working for some other company because we cannot meet his finances. Then once the STEM OPT started, I started working for some other company, but still part-time I was working for this company, my startup, and we managed a revenue of $50,000 for the span of one and a half year doing part-time. But then last year, November, again, I quit my full-time job second time to work on this company and the COVID situation happened. So basically we were in student leasing space, but because of COVID-19, we realized that it's not scalable in the long run. 
and we reached out to all the customers and got some feedback with which we again started a completely new company in january this year so that's pretty much our idea and by july i am going to i mean my visa is expiring by july and luckily in may first week i found you guys that there is some venture firm in california who is solving this because i enrolled in draper university where i heard nitin's speech about what they are doing so that's how i came to know so right now what we are doing is i hope everyone in this room there are the position where you are right now it's not because of some graduation or because of some google search or youtube videos right it's because of some experiences that you encountered in the past like many people they would have encountered the similar problems for example uh, uh, the previous person malika i think you know she was inquiring about how to do business being an international student she don't have any platform where she can interact with other person experiences if she was given that access you know it's very easy for her right that's what we are doing what we are doing is we are creating a platform where you have authentic users share their own experiences so that you can follow them you can interact with them for free as well as for paid if it's a long interactions just an experience sharing platform that's what we are building so uh, right now what i would like to ask you is sara so how is your investment thesis looking like in edtech sector because we are mostly in online tutoring but it's more like experiential learning you share your experiences so that other person can benefit from it and can better react to his decisions or you know take decisions i was yeah. trying to fill the form so i thought to reach out to you to introduce and you know talk about us yeah of course um well thank you for sharing your story i know um i'm sure for many of you the path to entrepreneurship and being a founder um is kind of a, a winded path um with many challenges and so i congratulate all of you for sticking to it it's not easy um in terms of the specific space that you asked about so um my my general so we are we're invested in career karma and higher club and so um it sounds somewhat similar to what career karma is working on which is helping connect uh students and um anyone really in the professional space with mentors and mentorship and coaches um to share experiences and and really build a large mentorship community and so what i would say when you're researching what funds to reach out to the majority of vcs have a non compete clause meaning that they can't invest in companies that could one day or are currently competitive with anything in their current portfolio and while this can be frustrating i actually think at the end of the day it's in a founder's best uh interest to work with funds that have a non compete clause because it means that even when there's an exciting space so like right now obviously like future of work super exciting top of mind a lot of people are building in that space you don't want a fund to be making like four bets on just future of work you want them to making one big bet on you and so we have a non compete clause within our portfolio when a company comes through our process that it flags you know the description or the deck or anything about it flags to one of us reviewing uh the company that it could be competitive with our current portfolio we actually just go right to our founders um obviously we as investors know their business plan we know their model we know what's going on um but the best person to make that decision is the founder and so based on your like quick description there my guess is that it sounds a little bit competitive with what we're already invested in i think it's a really interesting space um first round capital has an incredible mentorship program that they build internally and so i totally recognize the power of mentorship and coaching um i hope that all of you have you know somebody that you consider your mentor or on what i like to call like my bench um like i have a a few of group of people on my bench and i can always call them up um so it's a really interesting space um but my my guess is if you have or have not heard back from unshackled recently it's it's because of um the the nature of the competitiveness of it so just a quick question sara so i haven't applied for unshackled i'm planning oh. to apply before applying i just start to reach out to you so what i will do is i agree to that non competent plus so i will just do a research about that portfolio career comma that you mentioned and if we are completely different i would go ahead and apply and see if yeah. uh, how the things will come yeah out. absolutely um i hope all of you um we the pitches form on our website is honestly reviewed by three people from our investment team 
Um, it's a big part of my role. It's one of the reasons I chose Unshackled because they really are opening up access to early stage VC dollars to everyone. Um, and so I encourage all of you to fill out our form, look through, look what we're looking for, what are we asking at the early stage, um, and you will get um, some type of response. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, it looks like uh, we have a hand raised from Gerald. Uh, Gerald, feel free to unmute yourself. Hey, George. Yeah, how you doing, uh, uh, Sarah? How, how's everyone? Uh, I was looking on here. Do you, you so you, you don't really help not uh, citizens of, of the United States, huh? So our investment thesis is that one member of the founding team needs to be either first or second generation to the U.S. Um, that's our wedge into the VC market, um, and and that's kind of the first bar that we look at when considering companies. Okay, well that, that's that's kind of I don't I don't know if I if I apply because my family is native, and but my grandfather comes from from the uh, from the slave trade over there. And uh, and uh, what's that off of Haiti? Uh, that's where he's from. I forget, I forget the little country name, but I wouldn't I wouldn't qualify with that. Um, you're welcome to check out the the pitches form, and I can have one of our GPs look it over. Um, we're we I tend to defer to them to make the decisions whether or not someone hits our investment thesis. Um, and I think in my experience, we've been pretty open about the first or second gen rule. Um, but Manan and Nitin, who are the, the general partners of the fund, make the final decisions. Okay. All right, thanks. Yeah, of course. Oh, I think there were some questions in the chat if I want me to, to jump in on those. Yeah, um, we actually had one uh, from Raj. Um, is in it's one a.m. and he's in Bangalore, India. Um, he said he can't really do calls right now, but wanted me to ask if um, Unshackled is open to entrepreneurs in residence. Um, so currently, we do not have a formal EIR program. Um, we're always welcome to include you in kind of a, a network of advisors, um, but it would not be a paid position with any type of like official advisory um set up um but we see the strength of the especially the immigrant community and so when people have raised their hand and said that they would be willing to do a working session or connect with one of our founders we're always happy to to kind of see if we can make that happen but we do not currently have a formal eir program Oh, thank you. And I didn't realize this was in the chat too. Um, Eamon asked, what is the value add for Unshackled? Are there any specific verticals where Unshackled's team has the most experience beyond the call for entrepreneurs born internationally? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think my first response to that is like, whenever any of you talk to a VC that you're pitching, you should always ask this. Make sure you know what their founders are saying is their biggest value add because it's the VC founder relationship is so much more than money and equity. Like this is a long term commitment to work with these people. Um, so our first pretty obvious uh, value add, especially for those who are starting a company on a visa, is that you get access to our legal team, um, and then we project manage all of the the kind of steps that go into getting your visa sponsored. Beyond that, I would say some of our biggest value adds come from the programming that we run. Um, so Maria on our team has a strong background in consumer investing, um, as well as helping uh, founders with their downstream investments. And so Maria and I run um, a fair amount thinking about how do we help you prepare for your seed or your A? What are the metrics that you need based on the industry that you're in to raise your next round of capital? And how can you start that? Like from the first day we sign our term sheet to getting to that next round 12 to 18 months later. Um, my background then in recruiting and sales, I run programming on go-to-market strategy, how to set up your first, uh, your first kind of round of interviews if you're hiring for a non-founder role. Um, and then I also have done a few, a fair amount of HR projects. So I can step in and help set up kind of any HR programming that you would need to make sure everyone has benefits and things like that. Um, I would then say that one of the biggest value adds is that we unsilo our portfolio. So a lot of times VCs keep 
not only their companies separate, but also the companies that report to a particular point partner separate. We don't think that's the best move. I think it works for a lot of funds. For us, what we do is all of our founders are on a Slack group and they're able to communicate with each other. I think the biggest, like I can sit on a working session with a founder and talk to you about go-to-market strategy, but I am just end of one. I've seen it at a startup and I've helped a couple of startups do it, but I've never done it in the founder seat. And so what we look to do is connect you with the team that has done it six months ago and they brought their first product to beta or they had their first 100 users and helped that founder kind of see around corners for you and share their best practices um, rather than just one of us running a working session. Um, so I think one of the biggest value adds is our larger community. So you get access to all five of us on the investment team and then our 30 active portfolio companies. And then I would say beyond that, between our LPs and the five of us as investors have like an, another kind of round of like community that you could have access to. Um, and I think that's the biggest value add is just being able to talk to somebody who's been up at 3 a.m. like trying to get a company started or working or a product to market or like is debugging code but also on a sales call. Like talking to that person is gonna be the most helpful kind of conversation rather than like me, the VC, who's like only ever been in the, the kind of like helping seat rather than the doing seat. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Uh, I'm Cliff Payne. Uh, I, I currently advise and mentor uh, startup companies on branding and, and go-to-market strategies. I get lots of traction, lots of interest. The problem I have is that funding is always tight and they really can't afford to bring me in in an early phase. You know, they, 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 they bootstrap. So I'm thinking about pivoting to target companies at say the seed or round eight stage. The problem I have is that once the deal's announced, the funding is announced, they typically already have lined up the, the non-founders they want to bring in or the advisors and, and consultants they want to bring in. How do you, how do you track companies before they go public with that fundraise to, you know, to build a relationship before they've already picked people and decide to spend the money? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So sourcing, especially in the time of COVID is very interesting and challenging. Um, I think for, for you, if you're looking at companies seed and A, I think building relationships with strategic angels and pre-seed funds is probably kind of, could possibly be the best kind of road to action there in the sense that oftentimes friends and family go beyond friends and family rounds and include angels. And so I think, um, you know, I'm not sure where you're based, but if you're based in New York or San Francisco or- Philly. Sorry? I'm in Philly. Oh, great. So in Philly, um, I know that Penn and Wharton alumni groups have an angel group. Um, there are a few strategic angels um, that invest in Philly startups. And so I think tracking what they're like, reaching out to them and being like, here's kind of what I offer. Here's the, the type of teams I tend to work with. And also sharing, I think just being really transparent, like here's the price range. Like this is what I tend to charge. Um, and helping, having them help you make introductions to who they're investing in. Um, kind of getting the, the pre-announcement of Cedar A is interesting. And then from a sourcing point of view of how like I look to connect with entrepreneurs, um, I'm pretty active on like Twitter, GitHub, Medium, uh, LinkedIn, and just looking for anyone that puts like starting something, thinking something, building. Uh, I often think sabbatical is code for starting something. So I like, I'm a little bold in that reach out. Um, but just looking for people that have, you know, small signs of starting something new. Um, and that's who I reach out to. Um, and then we also build relationships with strategic angels um, to know what they're investing in early. I think the, the time of friends and family truly being friends and family is like either not necessarily coming to a close, but is also very limiting. Um, and so that's another reason we play in the pre-seed space is that not everyone has friends and family that they can reach out to and be like, hey, I'm looking to raise like $10,000 to get this company off the, off the ground. Like that's just not the case for most people. Um, and that's where we step in. Um, I understand seeds, but you mentioned a strategic seed. What's the difference? Oh, I say a strategic angel, meaning like- A strategic angel, angel letter. Yeah, I think that there's like, there's people who angel invest out of like a family office or an LLC. 
um, because they enjoy it. And then I think there's what I consider a strategic angel is like a head of product who is only angel investing in companies that need their expertise or a CTO or somebody who has sold into the enterprise security space and now invest in that space. And so I think there are like general angels who are people who are just like investing because it's fun and because they enjoy it. And then there are people who invest both capital and time. And I think finding the people that are also committing a fair amount of time to their portfolio um, will just be the angels that have better relationships with their founders. So we're able to make us more sticky introduction, but also able to share strategically why they invested in companies more. All right, thanks. That's a great answer. Okay, got it. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, so someone asked in the chat, what's the long-term strategy for Unshackled? Is it to stay in the way too early range for companies or to move later stage with portfolio companies? Um, so I'm not a GP, so I don't set any long-term strategy, just putting that out there. Um, our current strategy in fund two is to invest uh, first check only and to get in really early with teams. Um, so we tend to invest between 200 and 600K at the pre-seed, generally on a, on a safe or a note. Um, we tend not to see price rounds that early. Um, and that is the, the strategy for the rest of this fund. Um, and that is what I am, the knowledge that I am privy to as an associate. Um, you'll find that funds, there's like, I know most things within a fund. And that is like the long-term strategy is the thing that only the GPs know because it is their fund. <laughs> Hi again, Sarah. I have uh, one question. So. Uh, what's the best way to apply to Unshackle? So is it like uh, sending an email to you or yeah, just so form in the website? Yeah, the best way to apply to Unshackled is if you go to our website, there's a pitch us in like the top right and it opens up an Airtable form and that is the best way to do it. Um, all of those forms are reviewed by three members of our investment team. Okay, do you have any instructions like how many slides it should be or it should be a video pitch or anything like that? So, Please have a slide deck and not a video. I find video, like if you have a product demo that's a video, you can send that over as well. But I, we really prefer to have a slide deck that we can click through on our own speed. Um, and no, there's no requirement of like number of slides or anything like that. Okay. Um, so back in April, I participated in a competition, like a pitch competition. Is it like, would it be okay if I submit that one video as well? Because I had a pitch deck and everything on there. Yeah, that's totally fine. I just find that, um, and, and maybe this is perhaps more of like a personal preference. I find it very hard to, like when I look at a deck, I pause on certain slides to really think through them. Um, and so I find sometimes when it's a video, it's like at a different speed or a different pace than like how my brain is functioning. Um, and I often will look back and be like, what else have we seen in this space? How like, is this truly unique? What is the moat here? Like, what else have we seen happening? Or um, I track a lot of companies that have raised seed or A, like, so as a direct competitor recently raised a seed round. Okay, like what is different there? And so I think just being able to like go at our own pace is really helpful. <laughs> Is there anything specific you're looking to see in the slides? Like any, like, you know, like cells or like. Yeah. So we're like, we're, when I say we're truly open to pre-product and pre-revenue, I really mean that. And so I think the biggest thing I'm looking for in a slide deck is like, who are you? Why is, how or why is there like founder problem fit? So what about your background or what about your experience or what about the customer discovery that you've done matches you to the problem that you're solving? What is the problem? How are you solving it? And what is your moat? And obviously moats change um, as the company grows and scales. So it's like, what is your main moat right now is really the question. Um, and then uh, for me, the biggest thing is customer discovery. Um, how are you working with potential users? What questions have you asked them and what is the responses to that? Um, in terms of decks that get like, a lot of attention or like take up a lot of my thought is when a founder 
has gone really deep on a problem and can be like, I spent, and even if you've spent like a long time just like talking to users, sitting next to them as they use a product or go through a work kind of sequence to understand how they're doing something, um, that is like an element that I'm personally very excited about. Um, I think it shows like tenacity of founder. It shows that you've really concentrated on solving the problem and that you're not just solution first, which I think is like a very frustrating thing to look at. Um, there's a question in the chat that says, what other funds are targeting communities that are less likely to be able to pull together friends and family rounds, maybe not necessarily immigrant founders? Yeah, that's a great question. I think especially in the last two years, we'll call it, there has been this rise of like micro funds, um, especially super angels raising a small fund um, and having some institutional LPs or institutional backing. Um, and so I think you can look at any of the the pre-seed funds and so there's in san francisco there's a fund called a four ventures um there's bloomberg beta there is um moxie which is katie stanton's fund um those are like the first three that just came to mind but i would definitely say um looking at both angel conglomerates so like a lot of the tech companies that have exited recently in the last year now have angel groups. So there's like a Lyft conglomerate, there's an X, there's an Uber group, there's an Airbnb group. And so I think reaching out to those larger, larger angel groups, you can look at angelist syndicates. Um, so it's a great way to get to know some angels. I think it's also a great way to like kick off the conversation um, and start talking to some investors. It's just like, look on AngelList. Um, that is the main point of it. Um, and then I think thinking through angels or s funds that kind of go to the point I made earlier to Cliff's question of like strategic. So um, if you are a future of work B2B tool, like who could you put on your cap table that will have net new information to the success of your business? Are they angel investing? It's probably in their Twitter bio. Can you reach out to them? Do you have like, can I think have the cold reach out is totally fine just like have a reason and have um i always call it the one scroll test so if you're cold reaching out to someone make sure it's only a single scroll on a mobile phone that's about all people can read and like digest at a time um so cold emails one scroll test reach out to someone um i tend to say like two reach outs and then like take the l um i think more than that is comes off as like a little annoying um but two is totally fine in my, that's like my personal opinion. So take it or leave it. Well, yeah, we have more questions in the chat. It's like, um, does Unshackled prefer B2B to consumer? We are industry agnostic. So we look at everything. Um, I personally concentrate more on B2B enterprise. Um, that's just like where my interest lies. But Maria on the team is super excited about consumer. So we balance each other out. Um, and we are open to either. Um, Unshackled has this Thursday evening deadline. Can I make it ahead of the line? Can I make it ahead of the line? Um, if you have a round that is closing up, just put that in the round notes and we can see if we can expedite the process. Um, we generally take a week or two to make decisions. So if you have like term sheet on the table and like looking to close around in the next five days, um, our timing might just not match up and that's, on us and it's exciting for you that your round is closing and you know we wish you all the best um but yeah we do thursday night we schedule the pitches for the next week um and we kind of just run on a very system on a, a kind of a strict system um how many days does it take to get feedback once we submit our pitch deck also any limit on number of slides i don't believe there's a slide limit um, we tend to have people use like DocuShare or like some of the sharing that then you get, um, you have to have the right email address to be able to see it because then as you as a founder can track who's viewing your deck, I recommend doing that um, because then you can see who's clicked into your deck to see it. Um, it, te it tends to take a week to 10 days. It takes a week to get, um, so it's like if you submit in the third by the thursday deadline then the next week you'll hear from us 
Um, I review anywhere from 30 to 80 decks a week, um, just kind of depending on what deal flow is looking like that week. Um, so it does, and there's three of us, so it takes a little bit of time to get through everything, but you will get a response back. Um, we follow up with every team that fills out the full um, pitch us form. Uh, Sarah, this is a, just more of a general question. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, so when you're speaking to a potential investee, uh, are there any traits or qualities in a person that may prevent them, uh, prevent you from investing, um, even though they might have like a great idea? Yeah. Um, there's no like hard no's. I would say um, things to be really cognizant of is someone something that we look like is look for is what we call coachability um and loosely this is the idea like we're committing to a long-term relationship like investing in the pre-seed means we're going to work together for hopefully you know the next five to ten the way ipos are going 15 like some of these companies are staying private for so long years and we although we invest really early, we don't see ourselves as like investing, getting you to seed and then being like, peace out, bye. We continue to support our founders even as they grow it and raise um, follow on capital. And so I think we're looking for people who are acutely aware, like I think self-awareness is really big. And so we ask questions like, what are your superpowers? What are your greatest strengths? What are your blind spots? And founders that are able to be really honest and answer those questions in a genuine way, that makes us really excited. Um, and then I think it's this ability of a founder to be like, I am 110% starting this company. This is the space I wanna build in, but then also being really nimble and able to change. And so I often see this as like strong opinions loosely held or um, just being really open to feedback um, and I think some of the ways we see that is like, what was your original hypothesis? What have you done to prove or disprove that hypothesis? And how has it changed? Or how has your product changed? Or how has your thinking changed? Um, and founders are wrong, VCs are wrong. Like, that's fine. I think being honest about it and being like, look, our original hypothesis was that everyone wants to be on Zoom all the time. We then did, you know, 100 interviews. And it turns out people like only want to be on Zoom 50% of the time. And the rest of the time, they like want no one to see their face. They don't want to talk to anyone. So we like changed our product. And we now have, you know, some element of or feature that like is adjusted to that feedback. Like that's very exciting to us. Um, I think the, the a frustrating element sometimes for founders is when they come there like, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm building. This is the product. This is the like most important feature. We're raising capital. And if there's no element of like, we're testing or like, we're listening to our users or like we get feed, we have three design partners and we get feedback every week. And like, this is how we're being like super open to change, I think is a, is a red flag for us. Um, and then I think another red flag is if you aren't totally committed. And so that doesn't mean to say you have to like quit your job and like sold all your belongings and like are absolutely doing this. But if you're like, oh, I think I'm gonna start something, like I'm, this is a side project, like I'm gonna keep working at X, Y, and Z for the next like blah, blah, blah. Like you can still have a full-time job and be a founder. That is absolutely okay, especially if you're on a visa, but you need to be committed to it because if we're gonna commit capital, like we're gonna, we're really committing capital to you as a person. Um, and so we need to see that sign of like, I will do this. Um, and not like this is a passion project that like I might do. Cool. Thanks for that. Uh, I'll just read off some of, uh, more questions here in the chat. We got, uh, one from Eamon. Did you employ the two outreaches equals an L mantra when you were recruiting? I think you can push it a little bit more in recruiting. Um, just cause you're not asking for like capital. Um, I think just like, my biggest recommendation to people who are doing cold outreach, and like I did a ton of cold outreach when I was looking at jobs, like I have definitely done this, is like, remember that you're emailing a person and you probably don't clear, like I don't get to inbox zero every day. Like 
just be a human about it. Make it personal. Don't use a form. Like, have a reason. Maybe it's like, oh, we volunteered for the same organization, even though we were at different colleges. Like, wasn't that experience really? And like, find something. Like, especially like people in tech, people in VC. Like, we tweet, we write medium articles, we're on podcasts. Like, there is ability to get a lot of information about people that you're reaching out to. I think use all of that information to your advantage um, and have a reason or like a hook for reaching out. And then just remember that there are people and like if you email me six times and you keep pushing to like get coffee or get on a call with me and like I kindly say like, hey, like heads down working, like would really prefer to like answer any questions over email, like take that as the person still giving you some time and like send over some questions. Um, I just think the more like genuine and like human you can be about out cold outreach, like the better the outcome. When I get a form email, I'm kind of like, ugh, like why would I spend time answering this when like the person, it doesn't feel like the person put time into it. Makes a lot of sense. Um, how long do you spend reviewing each deck? Totally depends. Um, depends on the industry depends on the product, depends on the deck. Um, some things that I, I always do is I do a quick Google of like the, the quick description. We ask for like a tweet length description. I just like Google that and see how many companies come up just to see what's happening in the space. Um, I look through every founder's LinkedIn. Um, if it's an industry that I personally either haven't seen a lot in or don't feel super confident in, like it might take me a little while because I need to do some searching and I need to do some research and really understand what's going on. Um, so there is no set time to review each deck. Um, what I will say is building a deck is like very challenging. There's a reason that like consulting firms have an entire class of associates and all they do is build decks for consulting firms because it, it is like uh, an art and a challenge, if you will. Um, don't be too simple. So like don't have all photos, but don't like overcrowd slides with text. Um, I find it very challenging when decks are really just like feels like a research paper that's been put onto slides that I now need to read. Um, I would prefer you just send me, like, send a link and be like, hey, we've done a bunch of research, like, here it is. And then here's, like, a more simplified deck. Um, if I can't answer who you are, what the problem you're solving, and why you're unique after looking through your deck, um, like, that's a problem. Um, and so have some, I think a good, maybe a good exercise would be have somebody who's not on the team look through and be able to answer those three questions. Um, if they're not able to do it, like, I'm probably not able to do it, and, like, that's not great. Great answer. Thanks. Um, is this fund one for Unshackled? No, we're on fund two. Um, and then the follow-up is given that companies are sometimes staying private longer, private longer than normal fund timeline, and the fact that Unshackled is investing very early, is there a strategy around exits through secondary markets? Um, not right now and the GPs could probably expand more on that. Um, I think that generally speaking in VC, secondary markets are common. We have now even see founders uh, selling positions on the secondary at seed, which is pretty crazy, but it happens. Um, and I think that as a founder, just have a really transparent conversation with your VC about it. You can ask them that. Are you planning on exiting your position in the secondary? When you do that, will you let me know? Is there a side letter in the terms? Um, do you invest in SPVs through your LPs? I think great questions to ask any of the investors that you're reaching out to. Um, a, it shows that you're concerned and, and kind of you wanna know exactly who's gonna be on your cap table for the lifetime of your fund. And then you've also done your research on like how VCs work and recognize that um, where our fiduciary duty is to our LPs and at the end of the day like, we need to provide returns to them and as companies stay private longer and longer that means our LPs have to be more and more patient for returns. Um, using a VC port co lens, what are the things that early founders should be thinking about to add value and build their business early on that you see them miss on consistently? Put another way, what are underrated ways to build a better foundation to build your company on? Um, Hmm, a few things. If you 
if anyone on your team is a student, you better have used that like ability to do customer research to reach out, like ping every club, ping every group, ping every RA, ping every professor, get, you just have incredible access to people and it's generally free or like you can buy them pizza. Um, when I was a college student, I did a ton of customer discovery or like that I went to a college that had a big nursing program and there was also a lot of like medical studies going on and it was like, you bought me pizza, I would easily give you an hour of my time. And so I think using that to the, like the, the biggest uh, asset. Um, beyond that, I think uh, early success, think about, pick one strategy. You either have like a small group of incredibly dedicated users who are also going to give you a lot of feedback and be like design partners, if you will, and be able to go to raise your pre-seed or your seed with like those, and this is an arbitrary number, but I call it like 10 people who are like super users, or you have to go the route of like a very, very large number of users or wait list. Anything in between feels kind of in the mushy gray area. Um, I think if you're not a big salesperson or sales maybe isn't the greatest strength of your early team, that's totally fine. Go the smaller, super dialed in user route and be able to go to a fund and be like, look, we have 10 people using the product right now, but we talk to them once a week. They fill out a user research form and we're able to like really understand how they're using the product, what they're doing, what's going on with these 10 people. And that's how we're like framing it rather than we have a handful of people who like maybe use it once a month and like don't give us any feedback. So there's like the, the two camps. Um, the next question is, could a short runway be a red flag? What else is a red flag? Um, I think a short runway with a high burn is a red flag. Um, early on, I'm looking for teams that are able to be as lean as possible. Um, and so if you're, especially early on, if like 60% of your monthly burn is on marketing for any type of ads, um, or anything like that, that feels like a red flag to me. Um, but if you're raising capital because you need to raise capital, just that's fine. I think the bigger red flag is lying about it. Um, so if you're like, look, we have two months left, like two months of runway, got to raise money. Um, just be honest about it. There's nothing worse than like in a, you've like gotten a deal to diligence and then all of a sudden there's like a, you do like a final diligence call and they're like, actually we need this money in the next two weeks or like we have to shut down. That just feels like, then I feel like I've been lied to. I don't like that. That's not a good foot to start the like a long-term relationship on. So I think just being transparent and honest early will help you build better relationships with your VCs. Um, for anyone interested in getting outsider feedback, we do host, oh, someone hosts a um, pitch practice round table um, for all, anyone on Thursdays from 5.30 to 6.30 via Venture Cafe out of Philly. I think that's a great way to get feedback. I think um, practicing pitches, practicing having people go through your deck, getting any type of feedback is really important. Um, Something that's interesting, we never have a founder like log onto a call, share their screen and walk us through their deck. It's not part of our process. Um, we just do open conversations more off the cuff. Um, so I think also doing some calls like that. So sending your deck and being like, hey, can we do a call in two days where you just ask me any questions you have um, and just be prepared to like quickly answer anything, I think will serve you better in a lot of VC meetings than like memorizing a script that goes along with your deck. Um, I don't, I think funds kind of are a toss up and some have you walk through your deck and some don't. Hey Sarah, uh, one last question. So because you see that these days the immigration landscape is changing a lot, like with visas and everything. So recently, how quickly were you able to get a visa support to founder? Mm, it's a complicated question. Um, I don't have a direct answer right now because honestly, things are changing daily. Um, we follow our legal team and what they are following. And so I think the perhaps like the underlying question 
or like an underlying comment here is like, uh, Twitter is not law, despite the fact that perhaps Trump would like it to be. Um, and so while like fear mongering via Twitter is a common practice of his, that is not what we follow. Um, we follow what is actually being passed legally um, and what the actual rules of visas are. Um, both us as a fund, as well as our legal team, follow those very carefully. Um, please follow us on Twitter. That's another place where we tend to push updates when we see them. Um, the visa landscape is super challenging right now, um, both if you are in the U.S., if you're out of the U.S., um, if you're going to be able to get back into the U.S., when our consulate's opening, when our meeting's going to take place, when we don't know those answers, which is really frustrating. And I, um, I feel for everyone going through that process. Um, I have friends stuck in India. I have friends that are in an incredible waiting phase. And I know that it is both like emotionally challenging and also very frustrating. And so I don't have any strict answers to that. Um, we also work with Sarati Law out of Buffalo, New York, and they do um, entry level conversations. So like, I think they do a 15 minute free convo um, with anybody who's looking for help and I can, I've learned a lot in the last three months, but like your best bet is like, if you want to have a conversation with someone from Serati, check out their website, have the 15 minute call. They are lawyers. They will have better answers than I will. Um, I think going right to the source is the best, best way to do it, especially with the complicated situation that is currently happening. Okay. So we have just a two more minutes. So what's the best way to keep in touch with you, Sarah? Like uh, any medium that you prefer, or your email, if you can share. So that would yeah. be- um, so follow me on Twitter because I'm obviously trying to build a Twitter following um, <laughs> and um, follow Unshackled, follow us on Medium. Um, I think um, my email is sarah at unshackledvc.com. You can guess most VCs emails. They generally follow a pretty simple email chain, like email setup. Um, happy to have any of you email me with more questions. Um, but then follow Unshackled. We post a fair amount on our Twitter, on our Medium. Um, we are, you know, always excited to hear from entrepreneurs. Um, and then pitch us. Like, we seriously, like, um, we really do. Like, I flock off up to four hours a week where I just look at new pitches. Um, so fill out the pitches on our website. Um, send us what you're working on. Um, you know, we're excited to, to look at anything and everything. Um, and then, yeah, feel free to reach out to me uh, if, if you have any direct questions. Awesome. Well, we are uh, coming up on time here. If anyone has any final questions, you can shout them out. But I um, just want to mention, um, I will be sharing um, Sarah's contact information and links for following her and Unshackled in a follow-up email. Um, and I'll also include a link to the Practice Your Pitch session that Eamon mentioned. Um, I, along with a few others on this call, can actually can attest to uh, how great those, those conversations really are. Um, it's a nice little community that they've built there, and um, it's a great way to, you know, potentially see any blind spots or things you need to double down on, and uh, be a good place to fine tune your, your deck before you send it over to Sarah. So definitely encourage you guys to check that out. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, send me a follow. Um, feel free to send me a note. Um, I'm moving right now. So if I don't follow up like immediately, it's because I have been moving apartments in a pandemic, which has been quite the process. Um, so I am definitely behind on email, um, but I will catch up by next Monday. I've set a, a time limit for myself. Um, so if you don't get an instant response, that is why. Thank you so much, Sarah. Great. Cool. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for joining. It was great hearing all your questions. Thanks. Have a great rest of your Monday, everyone. All right. Take care.